Hello, fellow nerds and book lovers. Welcome to Red Cooley's Book Review. I'm Red Cooley. Today we're going to go through a good book. It's amazing how many bad books you have to go through to find a good book uh, and frustrating. Hopefully, if anybody ends up with the same kind of likes and dislikes in books, these reviews might help. I know that other people's reviews has helped me, so it would make me feel really good if these reviews can actually help somebody else to find good books. Rebel Fleet is... It reminds me a lot of the Columbus uh, series of books, the uh, Expeditionary Force series, uh, in an alien race that comes and they get humans to help fighting for whatever reason. Now, the nice thing about this book is, uh, like I said, it builds a backstory. It gives reason. It keeps uh, a really tight rein on the plot holes. One of the things that you're going to have to explain if you write a good science fiction book is why uh, a spacefaring species, which by default would be so much more powerful than the entire Earth and all of our military and all of our might, would come to Earth and, and even involve humans at all. And, and the book explains that. It gives a reason why. Uh, they come... Uh, they, they get the humans, they go, they fight the space battles. Uh, I'm not going to go any farther. I'm just going to say it, it's well written. Definitely buy it, add it to your collection. Um, so from this point on, we're going to go into some of the spoilers. As always, we're going to go through some of my notes and, and we're going to talk about some of the things that I like, some of the things I didn't like. The book has... Uh, a group of main characters. Uh, the main character is Blake. Um, it starts out, he's a beach bum in Hawaii. Uh, he's with some friends. They're trying to pick up on girls. And this object. Around the Earth, there's been these anomalies that have been going on. Uh, where the, there'll be some kind of anomaly in the sky. Well, it's what hasn't been passed on in the media is that apparently when these things are happening, they're dropping objects. How that got by, I don't know. Or if the objects were visible before, I don't know. But in the particular case of Blake, uh, it drops an object in the ocean off of Hawaii, and his buddy and him are trying to be impressive and, you know, curious about this anomaly. And his, they're trying to impress the girls, and his buddy says, let's go out there. And so they go out, and his buddy dives down. Blake's got a little bit more common sense. He's thinking, all right, this is probably something really stupid to do is to go out here and actually dive down and look at this. But he fits into the male personality. Uh, not just male, but human personality uh, of curiosity kills the cat. He goes out. His friend dives down, though, and he doesn't come up. And Blake's like, oh, shit. He dives down to see, and it turns out that his friend has actually touched the object underneath the water, and it's frozen his hand to it, and his friend's unconscious. Well, Blake doesn't want to touch the object, because obviously it's extremely dangerous, but he rips his friend away, pulls him back to shore, saves him. But then they look, and we, they find out that in ripping him away, it's actually ripped his hand clear off. The hand broke where it was frozen. Cool visuals, cool story. Just a really good start. Um, they go to the hospital, and his friend ends up dying. And the doctor is talking to him about it, and the girls are there talking to him about it. And he was an old Navy pilot. And he's thinking, you know, I need to call. So he tries to call his old Navy contacts, saying, I ain't get hold of anybody, but he thinks, you know what, I might as well try, and he calls the Pentagon. Well, they think he's a quack, like most calls that go to the Pentagon are. But then he starts talking a little bit about what's happened enough to get the operator to actually you know, put him on hold and shoot him up the chain until he gets a hold of somebody to actually talk to about the event. And they say, wait there, we'll come and pick you up. He has second thoughts and, you know, he doesn't really want to be picked up and put into some rubber room and interrogated by what's happened. He kind of he regrets having called, so he tries to get away. He goes and he spends the night with one of the girls that had been with him on the beach. Well, it turns out 
that either he had actually touched the object or just touching his friend that had touched the object. The object is a space probe that's starting a huge cage match worldwide. Anybody that touch it gets nanites transferred into their bodies that creates a sim or a symbiotic life form inside of their bodies. Basically, they get nanites running through their bodies which repair their bodies, but they also have computer technology. They have some kind of radio transmitting technology uh, that, that lets them talk to different computer devices. Later on, it'll let, let them take on the ships. So Blake has tried to avoid the police after he's contacted the Pentagon. And he was able to do it for most of the night, but then the next day, the two agents finally track him down at his house. Um, he tried to avoid him. He tried to get away, but there's just too much of a manhunt going for him. There are too many resources that he's up against, and they finally find him. But there's something off about these agents. They don't act right. They don't present themselves right. But on the other hand, he's working with the Pentagon. He could be working with shadow agencies. There's enough doubt that he's, he's careful, he's cautious, but yet he goes ahead and he goes with them. And so, you know, instead of taking them to a naval base, they start taking them just like off into the jungle in Hawaii. And he's just like, ah, this, this is wrong. And uh, so he throws the one out of the back door and they crash the car and a gunfight ensues. And the one guy uh, basically saves his life that had been attacked by the other guy. And it turns out that all of those have these symbiotic life forms. And these symbiotic life forms that you're infected with, if you touch any of these objects that have been dropped, uh, the first thing they do is basically switch on your aggression and implant the, the, the thoughts and the desires to find anybody else with a symbiotic life form and kill them. And as what it is, it's the start of this huge worldwide death match. And it's the first part that the aliens have in this test. And all it is is that they're selecting the crew of warriors they're going to take onto their ship. Now, the really cool thing about it, like I said before, was why would such a superior spacefaring race even bother with Earth? If they have that kind of technology, we're worthless unless you give them a reason. Well, the book does give a reason. It's kind of silly and it's kind of bureaucratic, but it's also believable. Basically, these space races have passed a law saying that anybody, any planet that's within their sphere uh, of influence has to give fighters to fight in the war. They can't just be protected by the other, other planets. You know, when you think about it, that's a law you could definitely believe being passed, even though it would create a huge expense and, and not really be wanted by the military. Uh, but they would have to follow it. So that's why they come to Earth to grab some people to go fight. And they don't really want that many. They want five. They want one crew, just enough to satisfy the law. Uh, Blake, for some reason, the, the nanites, he has a lot more control over himself with these nanites. They don't influence, influence him as, as much as other people. And it becomes apparent that there's different levels of influence that these nanites can achieve. Some people, it just turns them into raving homicidal maniacs. They have no control whatsoever. And Blake, it appears, is probably the one with the most control, even with the symbiotic life form in him. So much so that he gets with one of the girls that had been at the beach with him, and he's hiding at her place, and they end up having sex. Well, so when they have sex, he passes the nanites, the, the symbiotic life form to his, his girlfriend, you know? And so the next day she's trying to kill him. Um, one of the other guys uh, that had been trying to kill him before gets orders from somebody up on the ship. We, we don't find out about it. We think it might be somebody from the Pentagon or some from somebody, somebody in actual authority on earth, but it turns out it's who's in charge on the ship says, you know, this guy's different. Go pick him up. So when he shows up this time, instead of trying to kill him, he saves his life, uh, kills his girlfriend, cuts her head off. It's pretty brutal and pretty bloody military sci-fi. Um, 
and saves him. Instead of killing him, he actually, this time, he does grab him and starts to take him back. But Blake, he's a really cool character in that he doesn't trust this guy. He has no real reason to trust him. And he gets away again. He, uh, he shoots him seven times <laughs> and runs away. As he's running, the spaceship appears. And before it had been dropping off th these little objects all over the Earth to infect people. But this time, the first part of the contest is over. It's actually picking people up to bring them onto the ship for the next part of the testing. And Blake, he swims out into the ocean there in Hawaii to get away from the ship, figuring, you know, it's here at Hawaii. It's going to blow up the whole damn island. You know, I'm getting off the island. We'll, I'll, I'm a good swimmer. I'll just get as far away as I can. And it works well enough that by the time the ship finally figures out where he is, catches up to him and pulls him up into the ship, the second contest has started and he has no idea, you know, even what the rules are. Well, in doing so, the, one of the other girls, the girlfriend of his girlfriend, is on the ship. And the next scene is basically her asking if he's awake. And he's just like, yeah. And she clobbers him. <laughs> Knocks him unconscious, and he's out of it. A little bit later, he wakes up again, and she comes over, and this time he's smart enough to play, you know, like he's asleep. She's like, are you awake? And he doesn't answer this time. So she turns, then he attacks her. He's like, what's going on here? And she's just like, well, you don't get as many points for attacking the same person over and over again, but you still get some. And he's like, what? And basically, the contest was a continuation of the death match, but now it was on the ship. And if you you didn't have to necessarily kill somebody, but you did have to beat them down. You you had to win in the competition against them and be a decisive winner. And she was just uh, she was camping him is the term in video games. She, you know, she was waiting for him to wake up, knocked him unconscious, and just getting a few points. Apparently, she had done it the first time uh, when he wasn't ready and uh, had been just continually camping him and knocking him unconscious every time he woke up. You know, and usually, you know, that would kill somebody, but these nanites that they all have in their bodies now uh, help in the healing and can help the human body to heal. So uh, it just becomes part of the game. Really cool part. Uh, but anyway, he finally gets the upper hand on her. He fights through the fight. He comes out that he's one of the last in that particular group at this next stage. And there's five of them. There's the doctor that helped him and his friend at the hospital. There's uh, Gwen, his girlfriend's girlfriend. Uh, there's the Marine Samson that was... Tried to kill him originally and then came and saved him. And then he shot seven times. Is there in the fight. And then there's Dalton. One of the other guys that had tried to kill him. Uh, at, at the start. You know, in the first rounds. And he's like, Dalton is like, I don't know if he's British military. I, I pictured him as a British criminal. But that, that ends up being their team. And so now they're in teams, and then the last stage of the testing is another death match where they come against all the other human teams that have been picked up and, and created in this game. He gets into this death match, and him and his team win, and so they end up being the five-person team that represents Earth. So th then they get pulled in, and the spaceship takes off, and they're the only people out of all the Earth's population that's going to go and help this alien civilization in the war. Well, it, as soon as they're introduced, they find out, and it also it puts more backstory, that the reason that there's such violence in the games is, is this coalition, or really a horde. The, the, they're like a tribal horde system with space technology. The politics are ones of just violence, winner-take-all. Strength is really the only thing that's respected. You know, one of the first times that I thought it was a convenience or maybe a plot hole or something. Well, not really even a convenience or a plot hole. First time there was something in the book that I really didn't like 
in that they end up going to another planet and picking up more uh, alien races to, to put into the army. And so some of the aliens are having a hard time getting them to fight because everybody from that race, they won't fight each other. They have a racial connection uh, that, you know, humans, you know, you can get humans to fight each other all day. Well, this other race, they're having a hard time getting to fight. They put Blake and his crew into the arena to try and instigate a fight. And there's also some terrapins, some shellless turtle-like creatures in the same fight that hate Blake and his crew. Well, they try and make an alliance with the, the terrapins, the turtles, and the turtles turn on them. So they take the leader of the turtles out, and then Blake, because these turtles have such a structured group, he says, we took your leader out, we had an agreement, you guys got to honor it, and he confuses the soldiers in the turtle group now to, to come and fight with them. And the soldiers, you know, it's obvious that they just follow orders. Their leader's down. They go ahead and accept him as their leader. Really well played out. But they finally, with the new team, they beat all of the other teams. And then it gets down to all that's left is Blake and the two turtles. And the game's continuing. They're like, well, wait a minute. We won. You know, our side won. But the game continues. And then they realize, you know, the game doesn't recognize the Turtles and Blake as one team now. It recognizes them as there's still two teams left in the fight. And I thought, you know, the cool thing to do as a leader would be to say, you know, you guys came when I called. You, we formed an alliance. I'm going to take care of you. Shoot me and you guys can win. But he doesn't. He tells them, all right, you know. You know, to be honorable, you guys have to shoot each other and we need to end this. And the soldiers are confused, but they do it. And he, you know, Blake takes the win. And I thought, well, that was kind of a dick move. But then I think this is a horde, savage mentality in society. And, you know, I've been around rather savage individuals in different cultures in my life. You know, I've, I've been to places where, you know, if you cried... If anybody cried, you were never again accepted as a man. It wouldn't really matter how tough you were, what you did. If they saw you cry, or, or they saw any man cry, totally lose respect from then on. And that's the mentality that they've established as this horde has. So I, I, as, even though I didn't like it when I thought about it, no, it was right. He had to have the turtles be taken out and him take the credit because this is a, a horde like society that the only thing that's really respected is strength. So it, it, it was the right choice for the story, for the situation. It, it was really smart. You know, Gwen, the girl of their party, she's the most paranoid, but it actually gives some really cool character insights because she's so paranoid. She's always saying, you know, you keep, you know, trying to win these contests and then you win and all it's doing is painting a target on us because the only way that people get status now is to challenge us as the leaders or the higher ranked individuals in the army look at us as more capable so we get put into the more dangerous situations. And it, it, her insights and her logic build the background, build the story so it really works. Gwen turns into be a really good, intelligent character that brings and adds to the story. Well, Blake uh, gets into it with another group of cat people. And it's hilarious because they get into it and he defeats the cat people. And there's one male and then there's four females on this cat team. A humanoid cat team. Well, the lowest ranking of the females comes and she seduces Blake. And at, at first I thought the book was going to say, no, that's just icky, that's interspecies. But Blake is like, all right, you look hot. <laughs> and he goes with her. And I just like, it's a savage interspecies war. That, that was believable. It, it turned out to be pretty cool. And then the leader, uh, Roshesh, I believe, Roshesh, 
he comes and he he feels so personally offended because one of the females on his team is with Blake now, and he wants to fight and challenge Blake. And Blake is like, well, on my you made the challenge, I get to choose the weapons. We're using spaceships because Blake's a better pilot. And Russia is like, you can't. And the higher-ups say, no, you don't get to use spaceships for a duel. And it's like, all right, we're, we're using guns at 100 yards, which would negate Rochester's claws and his teeth. And Rochester is like, no. And he's like, well, fine. I'll trade you somebody on my team for somebody on your team. And Rochester looks at Gwen and he's like, yeah, that'll work. That'll, that'll satisfy. And so he turns to the British criminal. He turns to the British criminal Dalton and he says, all right, you got Dalton. <laughs> we get Mia the cat girl that seduced him. And it was just clever. I mean, you kind of saw it coming, uh, but it was just well done. It was a, it was a fun scene. But anyway, in their preparation and uh, getting with their ship and trying to learn this new horde, space horde society that they've been thrown into, then, then we learn a little bit about the enemy. And the enemy apparently is almost like a human elvish race. They don't have the conglomeration the the uh the the cur the wild groups have but it it even explains you know why almost all the species are bipedal uh, and it says that this originally this whole galaxy was seeded by one race but you know all of these species that are in this horde even the cat people the beetle like people the turtle people the humans they're all cousins they all share some of the basic original DNA with one another. Uh, it lays out, out a really good backstory, good explanation. Uh, the enemies are these Imperials, and they, they're all of one species. They're a species that's bonded together, and they're the structured Roman-type disciplined army. And, and they're the most powerful force in the galaxy. And the horde that they're a part of are just basically toys to them. And so it turns out that you find out that the war isn't really a war. It's just that the Imperials come and they test themselves and their warriors against the Kerr, against the barbarians, uh, this barbarian horde every thousand years or so. And the, the horde has never been able to win. They don't really have a chance to win uh, the way it's set up. But they fight hard enough and long enough and they take out enough ships uh, then the Imperials say, all right, the test is over, and they quit. You know, the problem being is any territory that they take, for the most part, it sounds like they pretty well keep. So you still you can't just run away. You still have to fight. It, it creates a, a, an interesting, a believable, a fun backstory, and a fun plot, and a good storyline. Well, they get into this next fight, and it goes really bad against the Kerr. They were trying to trap and ambush some of the Imperials. And the Imperials show up, but they show up in a much greater force than, than the Kerr were expecting. So the Kerr end up getting beaten and run away. And in this flight, Blake and his crew uh, get captured. Well, in the fights, and in, in this particular fight, they had done enough damage, and they had been integral in destroying one of the Imperial uh, carriers. And so he's, the, the ship that captures him is usually just going to destroy him, but he says just he's able to co contact them and call them and say, hey, I'm important. Don't you want to uh, take me as captive? You know, uh, I'll, I'll be a, a great political prisoner. I'll be a showpiece for you. And the captain is just like, yeah, you will. We're going to bring you on. And the crew is like, are you really going to be let us be captured? I mean, the stories and everything we know of says you don't really get captured, you just get tortured. And he's like, no, we're going to let him get us on the ship and they're going to blow up our engines and blow up their ship with us, which was cool. You know, they weren't just, oh, no, let's try and find this out. They were like, we're going to go out in a blaze of glory. Really cool plot. And then it was really good writing and they try and do that, but the Imperials weren't idiots. You know, somehow when they'd brought them on the ship, they'd use the tractor beam to drain their engines so they couldn't blow up the engines. Then when they blow the doors off, you know, the team actually does try and fight and is able to surprise a couple of the first soldiers, which are in battle armor, because they have some personal weapons, which are a little bit higher class than what most normal soldiers have. 
But, you know, they, they lose. You know, the Imperials aren't stupid. They're able to subdue them. They were smart enough to know they were going to try and fight. It's believable. The characters are believable. They act believable. They act consistently. You know, and the captain of the ship, she's this female elf-type Imperial, puts him in a cage and is going to torture him, tells everybody else just, you know, they're just going to be thrown into the, uh, uh, thrown to the bacteria. They have these bacteria vats. But the bacteria is like actually bacteria monsters that are used in the recycling system somehow. Just, you know, feed the bacteria with the rest of the crew. But is what he tries to do out of desperation is they have these nanites in their bodies from, you know, all the way through the book. And these nanites have the radio uh, ability and they use that to communicate with their ships, communicate with each other. It's basically like having, you know, a super smartphone in your bloodstream. Well, he uses it and it turns out that the Imperial ships, because they don't take prisoners, nobody ever gets on them. And they're such a structured society without crime in among themselves. He's able to hack right into the battleship and take control of it. And it made sense. It explains that, you know, in a society without crime, you wouldn't have firewalls. You wouldn't have these protections. You know, it was an accidental thing that he was able to use his SIM to take control of the communication systems of the ship. And becomes he comes from a horde society with such high aggression and high dishonesty and high trickery and mistrust you know, these Sims are very aggressive and intelligent for hacking and for manipulation. And he takes over an entire Imperial battleship. Excellent story. Well thought out, well developed, well put together. They finally get away. He uses his power. He gets, he gets back. You thought he, he had screwed himself. He tells everybody and everybody just freaks out. Just like, no. We can't actually go around killing Imperial ships. These are, they're just testing us. If we go actually putting up a real fight, then they come with their real army and they just wipe out this entire branch of the galaxy and kill us all. And it's just like that. You know what? It's probably true. And they test him and they put, lock him up. And then he's able to use his Sim to actually get out of their chains on the Kerr ship. And he's trying to get out. Then they're all clapping and they're just, they were in the other room watching him through a one-way mirror. And he's like, what? He's just like, we just wanted to see if you were, you know, really capable of what you were saying you were doing. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> it, it, it had some twists. It had some surprises. Loved it. Great story. So they try the trap again. They get everybody. And it turns out that only the human type, um, monkey type descendants are really good at the treachery and using the Sims to do this hacking. He trains as many people as they can. They actually really kick the Imperials, but, and, and uh, win the battle, it kind of wins the war. They get back to earth. And this was the other, the part that kind of bugged me because we find out through the book that there's Imperials that come. There's other species, which are in a horde. And they're bringing them back to Earth. And they're coming back to Earth. And I thought, you know, these guys really need to try and stay with the Horde and get some technology and bring it back to Earth. And what he decides to do is he decides to steal the ship that they've been fighting in that they used to come back to Earth. They hurry and as they landed in the Pentagon, they fake an explosion and hide it in the subway system. And that's the technology he brings back to Earth. You know, and I think they should have done a little bit more writing on, on him trying to say, well, I'm going to, you know, can we buy technology from you? Will you give us technology? It's kind of inferred. It might have been stated, and I just missed it, that the horde or the, the cur doesn't want the lesser races, doesn't want the humans to have the advanced technology, that they, somehow they're supposed to achieve it on their own. And that's kind of a dick move. Yet at the same time, it's like kind of a strategic move that humans definitely do with lesser technology countries or cultures. Uh, all of these Kerr and all the Imperials are, are supposed to be our genetic cousins. So it fits in with the personality and the logic would be, would stand to reason that it would follow somewhat along human lines of thinking and human lines of politics. So it makes sense that instead of staying and trying to 
get more technology or possibly he can't stay. It wasn't quite flushed out like I would like it to, explaining that, you know, that, that there, there was a need to steal the ship. I would have, you know, if I was in his position, I would have tried to talk to the team. Some of us need to stay here. Some of us need to go and join one of these other cultures. We all need to get together and join one of these other cultures, try and get technology and get it back to Earth. But for whatever reason, he chooses to steal the ship instead. And it's a viable option. It makes sense. Wish they would have explained why it made sense a little bit better, but it, it is within the realms. Uh, it's still a good story. You know, the, the, they pull it off and they get Earth some advanced technology, some advanced space technology. Um, the, there still is when they get back to Earth, they find out that there's still, of course, the problem of all the people that were just dumped back on the Earth from the original contest that their sims were going crazy. And all the people that the ship had dumped off that had lost the battle have just went nuts. They're all homicidal maniacs that are either dead or in prison. So Blake and Gwen go around the earth trying to save all of the people that have been infected and that they've been left with the sims turned on ag aggressive kill mode. Excellent book. Definitely put it in your library. Uh, I'd recommend it for you. I'm going to keep it on my shelf. You know, tell your friends about it. And that's really all I have for the book review. And to leave you with a thought for the day, uh, I, I heard today a really good one. It was, you know, strong people lift people up. They don't put them down. Darth Vader. Have a good one.